Hello and welcome to our Building an Engaged Workforce webinar today. My name is Karen Brett and I am the Events Manager here at ADP. Just before we start, I'd like to explain the interface on your screen. The main window is where the presentation slides will be displayed, then to the right you'll see a Q&A box. At the end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session where you can type any questions you may have. Please accept our apologies for any that we don't get around to answering today. We'll respond to these by email after the session. We'll also be tweeting live throughout and following the webinar, so if you would like to join the conversation, please make sure you're following us on at ADP underscore UK. We are delighted to introduce Professor Kerry Cooper as our guest speaker today. Kerry is the Director and Founder of Robertson Cooper and Professor of Organisational Psychology and Health at Lancaster University Management School. He is recognised as one of the world's leading experts on well-being and stress at work and has been awarded the Lifetime Practitioner Award from the British Psychology Society in recognition of his services to the profession. He has also recently been listed at number four in HR Magazine's Most Influential Thinker list for 2012. Also joining us is Trevor Townsend, who is ADP's Product Director. Having worked in HR software development for many years, both at ADP and elsewhere, Trevor is regularly sought and widely quoted in the media on self-service, outsourcing, flexible working and other issues facing HR and payroll professionals. The data and information quoted and used throughout this webinar has been taken from, from a recent ADP white paper, the, work, the Workforce View in 2012. It is the result of an independently commissioned survey carried out on behalf of ADP last summer. 2,661 employees from all over the country and from a diverse range of industry sectors took part in the survey where they were asked about their views, opinions and feelings on their work lives now and into the next decade with some interesting results. So let's start off by looking at some of the data to come out of the survey. The results were divided into five different areas. So Kerry, perhaps you'd like to start off by talking about how employees feel about their work in the next 10 years. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, we start off by taking a look at uh, how pessimistic or optimistic people are, and it's kind of worrying because 40% of workers feel quite or very pessimistic about the next 10 years. I thought it was quite interesting that even though we have very high youth unemployment, only 25% of 16 to 24-year-olds were pessimistic, whereas 52% of 45 to 50-year-olds were. And I think that might be because that age group, the 45 to 54 year old group, are probably the highly vulnerable people in terms of job loss. And I guess they might be very worried that if they lost their job, they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, get another job. Whereas it's good to hear that young people aren't uh, pessimistic, that they're pretty optimistic. Good news. And Kerry, uh, how do you see the general economy kind of feeding into the level of pessimism um, in that bracket of workers that are that are 45 to 54. Well, it's very interesting. I've just returned back from Davos, where I was at the World Economic Forum, and they had done a risk analysis globally of business leaders saying, "Are you optimistic or pessimistic, pessimistic about the future?" And the interesting thing is that there was a real sharp decline in the amount of pessimism internationally in big businesses. But of course, that's big businesses, Trevor. That's not you know, SMEs. Um, so I think that's quite good news that uh, last year was a lot worse than it is this year. Okay. So maybe uh, some of the more recent data that we've seen from uh, the employment market may start to feed through to see a rise in optimism over the next while? I think so. And also what w does worry me is the level of lack of optimism that we get from sometimes from government ministers, sometimes from the Bank of England, uh, you know, and the media in particular who will say, you know, that company has just gone bust or let go 500 people and don't say that, you know, the car production is up 12% and car sales is massively up. We need, I think, more optimism than pessimism in order to generate business confidence. And certainly I think some of the news we've seen from high street operators, especially uh, over the last while, you know, major focus on that and, and the news that unemployment or total employment in the economy now is, is higher than it was in, uh, uh, before the financial crisis struck. Yeah, and, and the private sector is picking up, you know, the loss of jobs in the public sector. And I think it's really good news. I think we have to understand that the engine probably for growth in the UK and optimism will come from the SME sector. They employ 
in the private sector, something like nearly two out of every three employees. It's yeah. not the big, big globals. So anything we can do to help the SMEs, I think, is really good news. Okay, so kind of moving on from there. So if we have these these fairly significant kind of numbers of pes representing pessimism in different brackets in the workforce, what do we think about um, the numbers we're seeing from our HR community? <laughs> I'm really shocked by this, really, and quite upset that that's the case. You know, 45% of of HR people are pessimistic. I mean, you know, they're the last people we need to be pessimistic because, you know, they're partly responsible for in, ensuring that engagement takes place in the workplace, that that employees are, are, are have high morale, uh, you know, are involved, are motivated. And I am disappointed, I think, to see that HR people are so pessimistic. I think even if they're thinking that, they shouldn't behave it. So, so Kerry, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the numbers around motivating employees? It is quite interesting and, and kind of worrying that a quarter of employees feel 25%. They cannot be motivated by anything. But I think probably the explanation is the job and security issue. And in this survey, 55% of people said that's the biggest single cause of worker demotivation. Um, so, again... Uh, unskilled manual workers really being worried about this, uh, and uh, again, um, and that's that's kind of worrying. But again, understandable given that quite a lot of the people on the front line have been let go in a lot of our manufacturing uh, scenarios and things. But hopefully that will improve. Not too bad uh, for the 45 to 50 year old, uh, 54 year old group, considering. They're, number one, highly vulnerable, a lot of middle managers in that age group. Um, also, they are very worried about uh, getting another job if they should lose their job. It's not too bad, but motivation is not high, but are we surprised given the kind of doom and gloom we're hearing in the media and elsewhere? So, with that kind of doom and gloom that we're seeing in the media, Kerry, do you think there's a different style of management required from those middle managers to... Uh, motivate employees and lead employees through uh, a period where, you know, the economy is not booming, a period of austerity than a period of, of, of boom. Yeah, I think we need a totally different kind of manager. I think that's our problem. I think since the recession, you know, before 2008, you know, we were uh, moving up, uh, we had growth, we had no kind of you know, worries and even underperformance to some extent could be tolerated. We didn't need to motivate too many people. You know, house prices were rising, growth was consistently rising. Uh, but this is a bad news scenario. And because we have this, uh, we're in this kind of continuing uh, downturn, I think we need a, a much more socially skilled manager in place. I think the criteria now that we should use in assessment centers and recruiting managers has got to be entirely different. We have fewer people, they're doing more work, they're feeling more job insecure, their motivation as we've just seen is down. What we need are drivers of motivation and morale. We need people who are socially sensitive to the needs of, of their teams to be able to be much more positive um, and to be very socially skilled. Their task competence to do the job has to be a given, but what needs now to be assessed when we're looking for the new breed of manager is how socially skilled and interpersonally skilled they are. Can they motivate? So if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a business owner of a growing business with, let's say, 100 employees, Kerry, what, what are the sort of things I should look for when uh, trying to bring talent into my business or to develop uh, existing talent that I already have around the, the social sensitivity factor? Well, I think, I think, and I, I guess I shouldn't say this as a psychologist, but I will. I think we do need to do some psychometric testing. I think that is important. I think we need to do assessment centers where we can actually watch people perform and see how they perform in groups. And I think we have to take our eye away from just their kind of bottom line results elsewhere. Because if we focus too much on their delivery rather than their personality, we may get the wrong kind of manager. We need them to deliver, don't get me wrong. You know, we gotta have business. But we need a different, we just have to be able to assess 
their competency at dealing with human be other human beings, getting them motivated, and so on. Okay, so moving on from that then, we're, our next slide on motivating employees, we're, we're talking about praise and recognition. Have you any comments around this? Oh yeah, I think this is really important. I think we tend to manage people by fault finding. You know, do something wrong and you're gonna to be told. When do we ever tell people? When can you ever remember, Trevor, in your career, or even me in my career in a university and working in industry, do I ever hear people saying, hey, that was a really good job, thank you very much. I don't mean bringing in a million pound contract. I mean praising them, not in an American have a nice day style, hey Fred, that was great, Janet, wonderful. I don't mean that. I mean when they do a good job, above and beyond the call of duty, do we tell them? We don't tend to. So pray, and what do they say? Praise is a very, praise and recognition a very significant part of engagement. And I totally agree with that. The other thing is, another motivator is, um, is flexible working arrangements. Why? Uh, it's not just about more women in the workplace and they need the flexible working arrangements, working partly from home, partly from a central office. I mean real flexibility. We have elder care as well. We have new technology which enables us to do that. And all the evidence I've accumulated over the years is you, if a company has the right to request flexible working as a part of their DNA, they will get back roughly three pounds for every pound they put in. And that would be for all employees, not just the ones that have kids. People want to work more flexibly. It doesn't mean they want to work 100% from home. But they want, and we can see here, a critical motivator of a quarter of the people in the survey is to work more flexibly. And that's because of the multiple demands we have outside. We just have, and also, what do you indirectly say to people when they apply for flexible working and they demonstrate, by the way, that they can work partly from home, partly from a central office without it detracting? What, do you, what does that say to them? That say, we trust you. We value you. You will deliver to the bottom line. We know you're going to do that and we trust you. We don't get enough of that. We don't have enough of this. Luckily, this government is considering now the right to request flexible working for everybody, not just people with kids under 16. And they're right, because the evidence is that's a powerful driver. Uh, the other bit about um, a fair and open leadership style, I think, is, is important um, as, as a kind of driver. The difficulty, I think, now is with the insecurity around a lot of managers, I'm afraid, are keeping uh, their cards close to their chest, you know, that they aren't being as open about what's going on and communicating as much as they should. Uh, it would be nice if we had much more open leadership. And certainly, I think, Carrie, um, when we're talking about leadership, you know, in, in, in times where, and I think the phrase you used earlier, where everyone's expected to do more with less, you know, that should drive an innovation type culture where people are looking at, you know, the resources they have, the capital they have to spend, the people in their business to say, well, look, you know, things aren't as flush internally because of budgets and what have you. But that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't lots of interesting things and interesting work to do. And it, and it, it certainly should drive innovation. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, yeah, we want to drive innovation. And to drive innovation, you need, a, I think you need managers at all level from shop floor to top floor who allow innovation and risk taking. You know, when you're in a scenario we're in now, there is there are a lot of constraints on innovation, on, on people taking risks. Listen, people who take risks will make mistakes. There is no question about that. And we have to tolerate I mean we don't want to tolerate somebody making multiple mistakes, but we we, we have to expect that if we want to innovate and take risks People will sometimes fail. Their ideas won't work or whatever, but that doesn't mean we should punish them because if you do that, you'll never innovate. So we're hitting upon some key issues around uh, uh, engagement. We're talking about trust. We're talking about uh, giving people uh, freedom to, to be creative. We're talking about uh, work-life balance. We're talking about people understanding um, that working in an organization um, in, in tougher times may mean a, an alteration in style and developing the social side of, of management. Um, how do you think that's going to that's going to play out um, when we take a look at some of the some of the, the the numbers we see next around workers not seeing a, a dramatic change in in work over the next ten years? Uh, I think they're wrong. <laughs> I think there will be fairly dramatic change. Um, 
but remember, 30% see no dramatic change, 70% presumably see dramatic change taking place. So the 30% I think are wrong. I think there'll be dramatic change, and, and there'll be several. There'll be demographics, there'll be more women hopefully moving up the hierarchies of all businesses. I think we need, dare I say it, a female management style, because I think their EQ, women's EQ, emotional intelligence is higher, and perhaps we need more women in senior roles. Not just on the board, not just token women thrown on the board of companies, but women actually moving through all the ranks of organizations. Like that demographic change can take place, and I think that will change the management style of quite a few organizations. Um, so I think that's one of the, 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 the changes that are going to take place. Plus, I think more flexible working will occur as well. Um, uh, but in looking at the results, we see, don't we, 10% believe there are fewer opportunities for women, which again means that the majority think that there are opportunities for women, and there certainly are. Whether they stay in a male-dominated management style culture for long is a different issue, and maybe the Norwegian model is a good one, where the Norwegian government forces 40% of women to be on the boards of companies, although I think it's not that level where we need women. I think we need them all through the hierarchy. 30% um, of HR professionals highlight a lack of female models. Absolutely right. We need, we need more women. We, mean, we need more diversity full stop, not just women, you know, ethnic minorities, a whole range of different kind of people in our organizations, because that's what we're like outside. Uh, and 50% of employees believe there's a glass ceiling at the workplace. Um, I'm surprised that's that low. I think there is a glass ceiling. I think it still exists, even though we talk about equal ops and the rest of it. Um, and I think that comes in the form, by the way, of a long hours culture. If you have a long hours culture with men not really taking up their share of the domestic responsibility, then you uh, get women uh, in a long hours culture not able to do the outside, domestic, home, child rearing, and all the rest of it, and do a job. What we need, I guess, in, in, a, in a sense, is men taking more of a responsibility. But I think, we, 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 this is, I think this is an, an issue. It will be resolved gradually. Gradually, we're seeing more and more women moving up the hierarchy. They will begin to change the culture. The hope is they'll stay there and not be dissuaded from leaving. So the number that we see there, do you think that um, the HR professionals have a, a keener sense that there is a glass ceiling and that their perspective on uh, growth and uh, progression through an organization it moves, moves the figure from the general population um, of employees up to 70% when you talk to HR professionals? Yeah, absolutely. But do remember the majority of HR professionals are women. <laughs> So it's not surprising, except that when you look at the top of, organ, uh, of the HR profession, it's the, the, a disproportionate number of men. But you're right. No, I think they have a, I, I think they have a good handle on this. And, and, I, and there is a bottom line to this. I mean, I, I think we need a much more, as I said earlier, female management style. I, I think we just need, you know, better, as I said earlier, socially and interpersonally skilled people, and I think women make a contribution in that arena. Also, they will understand flexible working a lot more than men will, because they need it in trying to juggle all their roles, and wouldn't it be nice as well if men applied more often for flexible working? If you look at the figures, women are significantly uh, higher in applications for flexible working than men. So we've uh, a couple of pieces on the next slide about um, some intergenerational issues and flexible working carry. Um, I would be interested in understanding uh, your interpretation of the inter intergenerational term. Yeah, I think Trevor here, I, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by intergenerational, what the questions were, but what, uh, the way I would interpret it would be this, that there's going to, older people will work longer because of pensions, right? And because they're fitter, older, and can and want to. And by the way, given the rise in dementia, it's probably good for our society that older people are working longer and are much more cognitively active. So I think what that means is we are going to have younger and older people in the workplace, and particularly older people of the retirement age. I mean, 20 years ago, we had early retirement, the big thing, everybody leaving by 55. Now we have everybody staying until they're 70. 
So this is going to make, and I think it'll be great because I think it'll make more organizations more like families, you know, with grandparents, parents. We have different generations. And I think the young can learn from the old, and the older worker not only stays cognitively active, but can mentor a lot of the younger people who are coming up. I think that's a real good thing. But maybe what we need to do here uh, 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 that I think is might be important is maybe change the role for a lot of older workers. You know, there'll be some who won't be able to do the really stressful jobs. So, you know, we just create other mentoring or different kinds of jobs for older workers. You don't always have to keep climbing the greasy pole. You may be able to just take a different kind of role as you get much older. So you don't have to take the stress and strain that you, you could cope with when you were 45 or 50. But the other thing is on flexible working and technology. Uh, I don't think we're going to move towards remote working. By that, I mean people working exclusively from home. We are definitely going to move toward flexible working. New technology will enable us to do that. You know, why in heaven's name would you commute into London in packed trains to get to work to then do your emails? Why in the world would you do that? Why would an employer want you to take an hour and a half to get into the big metropolitan areas and then end up doing your email. Why not partly work from home or come in at 11 o'clock, do your emails, do the things you want to do from home and come in when it's less pollution? Let, it would be better for society as well. So I think we're going to have much more of that. Certainly, and I think we have some more statistics coming up on flexible working and technology. And I think one of the things when we get into this is, again, for businesses uh, to embrace this change, uh, you know, some practical, some practical tips or some practical kind of uh, guidance on avoiding issues like isolation, making sure people aren't too remote, uh, putting in place tools and technologies that allow people to stay connected with, uh, with the business. Are there other things out there that businesses need to be co cognizant about, maybe some of the tensions that uh, an introduction of flexible working arrangements can, can introduce in the workplace, Kerry? Yeah, I, th I think so, Trevor. Well, first of all, there'll be, as we see in this slide, a proportion of people who don't want to work flexibly, who want to come into a central office, you know, I'm a nine to five, or well, there's no nine to five, let's say eight to seven or because that's how it's changed now, the working hours primarily. So we'll come into the work, uh, into a central office environment, and that's it, and they don't want to work from home, and they differentiate their home life off. So we have a proportion doing that. Uh, some see uh, the virtue in, in mixed flexibility. That's partly from home, partly from a central office. I think that's probably the major. I think we're going to get that sec segment will increase as long as they don't think their career would be adversely affected if they work flexibly. There are people who are worried about applying in a job and secure market like we're currently in, applying for flexible working for fear that that will say, I'm not committed, when jobs are really problematic. I think the other group uh, who want to work maybe from home, substantially from home, are kind of worried about blurring the lines. How do I differentiate it? Will my home life, my kids and everything interfere with it and everything else. There is a problem. We're not used to working from home exclusively. That will take some getting used to. It will take some uh, very careful thinking about how we structure the workday when we're working, if we're working more exclusively or more often from home. That will mean, hey, that office, I work in that office. Kids don't disturb me during that time. We all negotiate this, how we're going to do this. And you have, well, I think we're going to have to think about that. And the lonely bit. That's why I think the vast majority will probably go for the, the you know, a, a mixture of flexible and fixed hours. I think that's where everybody's going to go. Because we also have social needs, and being at home can be very lonely, right? Aside from differentiating your home and domestic issues from your work issues and not being interrupted by both or the two blurring themselves, the other issue about meeting people's social needs is quite, people like to go into the work environment to talk about their boss in a negative way, to whinge, to talk about football, how England did against Brazil, et cetera, et cetera. So they have social needs to be met. So I think that the, the number of people who are actually wanting to work exclusively at home will be minimal. So we see flexible working, you know, being enabled by technology, people to stay in touch with the organization, the organization be able to cope with the demands of scheduling people around core hours and ultimately the business still has to run, it still has to meet customers' needs. 
Absolutely. Oh, look, look, the customer is really important. We've got to get business here. You know, we got growth. We need to do growth, right? It's HR's responsibility. It's line manager's responsibility to see how do we get the most out of people. And I think one of the ways, is, as some of the stats here have shown, one of the ways that people want is just to be trusted. They want to work a bit flexibly. They don't want to have to – look at all the downtime we waste commuting in and commuting out at, you know, at 7.30 in the morning. 5:30 at night. People want more flexibility, uh, but uh, but I think I think we can manage that and and meet their needs and also be more productive. And when you talk about productivity, how does flexible working uh, kind of play into the wellness agenda, the wellness at work agenda? Oh, it plays in very well. The evidence is we did this in the mental capital and well-being foresight program for the government, and we found flexible working uh, increases job satisfaction. Increases productivity. Uh, it it is it's it it the bot there is a real good bottom line and there's ton uh, to this as an issue. It you'll get less turnover. You'll get less sickness absence. It is the future. I mean, we just have to do that. But I think with the problem we have here, Trevor, that I think we which I think blocks this from happening is managers. A lot of managers like their troops in the office so that they can manage them there and then and don't know how to manage people because they have to then set objectives, uh, they have to monitor it, they have to, and we're not used to doing that. So I think a problem, an inhibitor here is the manager themselves to let go. And there are organizations, there's one in the private, and there's one in the banking sector, which is great, and its model is, you, t you have to communicate to them the kind of flexible working scheme you would like. You go, to, you go to the HR department, not with your line manager to communicate it, but you have to provide a business case so it won't adversely affect your role if you're a marketing manager or whatever your role is, right? And then, once it's agreed with HR, then you bring in the line manager. And I think it's the recognition that line managers actually don't like this. So we have we have the line management community. I think that need to trust their employees more, need to be more uh, socially sensitive in the current environment. So there's there's lots of challenges for business, not just to introduce engagement or flexible working initiatives, but also to work with their their management teams to to help them to develop to support what the workplace is now demanding. Oh, absolutely. And you know, if the bottom line is that enhancing the kind of well-being, involvement, engagement of people in the workplace contributes to the bottom line. And, you know, David McLeod's work on engagement has demonstrated its impact. Then we have to really start to adopt this. And really, I guess we're leading into the next slide, which is about skills and talent. Um, and maybe we just need to train managers in a different way. Number one, we need to select different kinds of managers, but I think we need to train our existing managers to be more engaging, to be more open, uh, and I think that's going to be quite important. The skill base for managers is going to have to be upped. We need, to, we need a, different, we diff a different look at what the, the role for the future will be. So we've been talking about kind of the employee perspective and the data back from the uh, employee perspective over the last little while. Um, what are the key concerns from your perspective, Carrie, from uh, an employer perspective? What are the, you know, engagements is, is, obviously, is obviously up there. Any other kind of key things that employers should be, are, are talking to you about in the course of your work and you're detecting through, through your research? Yeah, I, I think employers are, you know, trying to find, uh, you know, the keyhole, as it were, uh, so that they can get highly, you know, get people more motivated, uh, improve morale. I think basically morale isn't particularly high at the moment because of all the negativity that we talked about earlier, not only in the press, but we get from the Bank of England. It doesn't help when government, for example, says, uh, well, this could go on until 2017, 2020, 2025. That doesn't help when anybody says that because that just makes people more morose. So I think employers say, what do we do? How do we – engagement is one thing. So we need, a, we need managers to be more engaging and not, by the way, just to tick the box because I do worry about the measurement of engagement. 
I think a lot of companies are using engagement scales. People are filling them in and not really engaging their employees. We saw from an earlier slide that employees say, for example, that I want my manager, my line manager, to tell me when I'm doing a good job, to manage me by praise and reward. That's not an item you normally see in an engagement scale. And engagement, I think, seems to mean to quite a lot of managers something like getting them involved in decision making, uh, uh, communicating as much as you can to them. Uh, it's not necessarily about how you kind of chivvy them up from a social point of view, how you make them feel part of a family and a team. Uh, and yes, those other things are important. But I, 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 I think we really have to go beyond the engagement movement as we're currently doing it, which is a kind of measurement movement. And I think we've got to go on and see the, the kinds of behaviors we need and, and probably train the ones who are good at this. But what do we do with a large number of managers who are not naturally engaging and you're not going to be able to train? Big question. What are you going to do in your selection process? Are you looking for the right kind of manager in your selection process? Um, and I think that is quite, quite a big issue. The well-being movement has taken off. And I think it's because there are too few people in the work environment. They're doing more work. They're more stressed. Uh, they're getting less balance, et cetera. They're more worried more, and, and so on. I think it's about the big issue they talk about. How do we retain them? And they talk about something that I think is a key issue for all of us. It's called regrettable turnover. Regrettable turnover is when you're losing really important staff you can't afford to lose, right? You can have turnover, but what if, you, what if your turnover is of the very people who make your business successful? So they're worried about retaining people. They're worried about motivating the people they've got. And I think that's what the well-being movement's about. How do we... Give, meet their needs, but at the same time deliver to the bottom line. And that is possible. One isn't independent of the other. And I, somehow I think, you know, in the past, I think senior managers have always thought that the way you drive production is you work long hours. By the way, there's no evidence if you consistently work long hours, you're more productive. There is a lot of evidence if you consistently work your employees long hours, they will get ill and be less productive and also damage their family life. Tons on that. I think we just need a different model in people's heads. But the good news, I think, the real positives that I saw from, from Davos and I see when I go to industry, is they're into, now they see more that the well-being issues and engagement issues are the big ones now for the next five years, given the scenario we're in. So uh, I think one of the things that uh, I would see with working with ADP's customers. We have a range of customers from very large organizations with tens of thousands of employees down to, um, you know, businesses in the growth phase that are owner-manager and, uh, and, and, and starting to gain some, some scale. One of, one of the big challenges is for, the, for organizations all across that spectrum is tackling something like the wellness agenda and saying, well, where the hell do we start with this? You know, how are, how are you seeing organizations that are successfully implementing the balance between bottom line, engagement, talent development, talent acquisition, and, and uh, wellness? How, how, how are they going about, A, putting strategy together and then making strategy happen at the front line? Because we all know that's not easy. No, you're absolutely right, Trevor. You know, you know my experience tells me the following. It's like anything else, and this I don't think has changed over the decades. It's always led by a product champion. You know, somebody, somebody at the top of the organization who thinks this is really worthwhile and this is a bottom line issue. You know, engaging your employees, well-being and everything else. And you, we need more of those kinds of people in senior positions. I think the young graduates I'm seeing coming out of Lancaster University Management School with MBAs are that type. They now say things like, I don't want to go work in that sector because it's too greedy, or I don't want to do this. What I want is I want to work for a company that makes me feel valued and trusted, and that's what I want. And I may go work for some of the companies that are pretty um, robust, that's the word I'm going to use, are pretty robust, long hours cultures and all the rest of it, to put it on my CV for a year or two, but I'm not going to stay. 
uh, I'm not going to stay there at all. I think what we need is more product champions, more people to understand, and I guess that's people like me who do academic work, that this has a bottom line impact, and I think that's probably what we have to do to start with. But even if you show the bottom line, if the people at the top of the organization really don't believe it, you know, they say, yeah, nice to have, but, you know, nice to have in good times, but not now. Uh, it's not going to work. You need buy-in by senior people. I suppose with a lot of uh, initiatives in HR, we, we touched on measurement, and I agree with you, you're absolutely right. Measurement, just because you measure turnover or you measure engagement or you um, measure your talent pipeline, doesn't all it is is a metric. It's not the tool to, to manage it. Um, what kind of metrics are there out there to, to help us to win the argument to make the investment into execution of these types of initiatives, Kerry? You, you mentioned some, um, some research that's been done on how excessively long hours has a negative impact on the bottom line because at the sea level in organizations, these are the things that, that CEOs, CFOs, um, head of people strategy, these are, these are things that these people need conviction to, sh to, to spend shareholder money or to invest out of their own pockets if they're an owner manager. Yeah, well, I mean, this is can we this can be done. You can do the diagnosis on well-being and where the problems are in organizations and unblock them and improve it and get the employees to engage in in reaching the decisions about how to do this. By the way, it's the way you're supposed to do this. But I think what's also important for companies is this particularly for medium to large companies, I think putting on their annual report the metrics on what I would call be what I would call well being indicators is also very useful. So for example, why don't you, you know, have job satisfaction scores? What are our job satisfaction scores? What are sickness absenteeism scores? What are our metrics on presenteeism? What are in other words, and by the way, uh, BITC, Business in the Community, has done that with a number of large companies. We're trying to get them, these large companies, to put on their annual report and not the CSR report, not the, you know, uh, you know, social responsibility reports, because nobody reads those, putting it on the main report, showing what the metrics are about what employees perceive their company to be like. Now, some companies are doing that on engagement. But I think engagement is way too limiting. That's maybe one indicator. But how about the hard metrics on what is your sickness absence rate? Have they improved or gone down? What is your present? We can measure presenteeism. Um, so we can measure present. We can, we can take a look at turnover. What's the turnover like? Are you losing good people? So I think we need those kind of indicators so that um, when people are looking at it, when the, uh, your st shareholders are looking at it or stakeholders are looking at it, they're saying, doesn't look very good. You know, your sickness absence has increased from last year. Your presenteeism has increased. This is not good news for us. I, I think at least that would be a metric to get the attention of the shareholders. It also, you, you mentioned not just shareholders, the stakeholders there, and one of, one of the stakeholders, in my view, that would also consume this type of data is potentially that uh, socially sensitive uh, manager who wants to work in a business that values performance but doesn't flog employees to the point that, that they become ill. Um, so all of this could potentially con uh, contribute to the, to the employer's brand in the, in the talent marketplace. Oh, ab ab absolutely. And what about also just thinking, you know, if we're talking about real engagement, real engagement is also about sh uh, share ownership. And what about the John Lewis model? Why don't we have more of the John Lewis models around? I mean, I don't understand why businesses, why do we just give senior management share options? I, I don't understand the logic of that. Share options should be open to everybody in an organization, not just the senior management. I mean, if they've worked there a number of years. It should be open to everybody. You get much more involvement and engagement if you do that. You give them a share of the business and uh, not just a bonus here and there. Uh, and I think we have to revisit that one. I think that's an, in, an interesting one. But how do we retain people? Give them some share ownership. Get them engaged in decision making. Treat them properly. 
make them feel trusted and valued, try to meet their needs, treat them as an individual. We're all individuals. Even if you talk to the very senior people in organizations, they'll tell you about, you know, they pretend to be extremely tough and, uh, you know, resilient and everything else. But when you go below the surface, and I've talked to chief execs and a whole range of very senior people over my career, and they're just like everybody else, you know, their long working hours, they'll tell you and admit that it's damaged their marriage or is damaging their relationship with their kids. They'll do that. If it's doing it to them, what do you think it's doing to other people who have less control? And by the way, in the UK, we have great managers. We have a new breed of, of people. Uh, remember, 20 or 30 years ago, we graduated something like 1,200 MBAs a year. Now we're talking about thousands of them, well-trained, very optimistic, very positive. I think the future is, is very positive, particularly if we get the right kind of managers in place, which we are getting. We are getting more socially skilled managers, better trained managers in there. We're getting a better mix as well, uh, 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 gender mix. We're getting more women into middle and senior management roles, and we need them to move up uh, the hierarchy as well. And we need to enhance the EQ, the emotional intelligence of our of our managerial workforce. Uh, HR is doing a really good job. They're on top of this. They're into well-being, to engagement. They're into all the right strategies that are going to take us forward. We we can overcome the kind of uh, constraints on us, uh, on us that this kind of recession has had. We can get out of this. We have the workforce to do it. We have the attitude to do it. We have the trained people to do it. We just have to uh, just persevere and just be resilient during these difficult times and, and make a, a real uh, effort at enhancing morale and motivation and making people feel valued and trusted. Kerry, thank you very much. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed talking to you this afternoon. I'm going to hand back to Karen now. Okay, thank you very much, Kerry and Trevor. Uh, very interesting discussion and some great practical tips and tools there. Um, if you have any questions, as I mentioned earlier, if you'd like to type them now into the Q&A panel that I mentioned earlier, and we've already had some through, so I'll start with this one. Um, a lot of employees feel undervalued and cynical and that any attempt to address this is just lip service by employers. How can we ensure that our efforts are credible and real? Um, I don't know if you want to take that one, Kerry. Yeah, I'll take that one. Yeah, I, I think uh, the employers that are trying to do something about engagement, well-being, trying to motivate and in, uh, their employees and, and enhance morale, I think the majority of them are really making an effort. I don't think it is just lip service. I, I would be bothered if all they did was do an engagement scale and then report back the findings without doing anything about it. When my experience is, when organizations do well-being audits, identify where there are blocks to well-being, and they tend, in almost all cases, to try to do something about it. They don't just put it in a drawer somewhere or dump it. And I think, I think the majority of organizations that are signing up to enhancing morale, well-being, engagement, all of that, uh, I, I think are making efforts to do things about it, making substantial efforts and it's paying off because the evidence, we have tons of evidence of what organizations are doing and the impact it has, and the stats show it's having an impact. So I don't think it is just lip service. If it is, uh, you, will be damaging, uh, in, you will be damaging your retention and recruitment in the long term. Uh, I've got another question here. Um, how can we, as HR professionals, overcome senior management director level objections to employee, I'm sorry, employee engagement initiatives? So, uh, I suppose my experience operating with various stakeholders as a director or board level um, is very evidence based. So, I think some practical things that that I would advise: have your underlying metrics in place. Um, take a look at some of the key indicators around engagement. Some of the things we spoke about today around, you know, what's my absenteeism look, look like? What, you know, what are my engagement scores looking like? And try to get a, a kind of a holistic view of where the organization is right now. And actually ask your employees, ask your employees the key questions. Build up some evidence, 
put a business case together and there's lots of evidence within your organization and as uh, as uh, Kerry has said in the, the pre answer to previous question there's lots of evidence out there from the academic community and uh, from our professional uh, professional bodies to, to put a business case together that supports a plan to uh, underpin a change within the organization but you know paint picture but make sure your, your your picture is supported by by good good evidence within within the business and making sure you have the tools in place to give you that information okay thanks Trevor um, Kerry I think this is one for you probably if we could only do one thing differently to foster employee engagement what should it be put in place the right manager I think if you take a look at what Dame Carol Black's report showed, my report for the government on mental capital and well-being, and even the nice guidelines on stress management in the workplace, the one thing we all say is the line manager is critical to the health and well-being of employees. Okay, thank you. And I think this is going to have to be our last question. Um, unlimited holidays seem to be a growing trend, especially in the technology sector with companies like Netflix and Rich Relevance. Um, are initiatives like this real motivators or are they just recruitment gimmicks? You, you're going to do this, Trevor, or you want me to do it? I haven't seen this trend before, to be honest. I have no comments on it. So. All right, I'll do, I'll do it. I'll do it. I, I personally think that if an organization has unlimited holidays and the object of the exercise is to say we trust you to get on with your job and this is a reward because we value your contribution, then it's a worthwhile thing. If it's a gimmick for PR purposes, then it's bad news. Okay, thanks Kerry. Um, I'm afraid we have lots of other questions, but I'm afraid that's all we have time for in this session. If you have sent a question across, we will email you directly with a response afterwards. Um, so thank you all for attending today. For all of those of you attending live, you will be sent a hard copy of the white paper this webinar was based on, as well as a copy of Kerry's latest book, The High Engagement Work Culture. Thank you to Kerry and Trevor for your time today and for your insights. The webinar recording is available on the events page of our website if you would like to view it again or if you would like to recommend it to any of your colleagues. Our next webinar is due to be held in April and will be on the subject of pension reform. Please visit the events page of our website for further information about this as it becomes available and about our other upcoming ADP events. We look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you to our next event, so until then, goodbye. <laughs>